Welcome to the Folktale Project. This is Dan Charles. And this is The Sleeping Beauty in the Wood, or Charles Perrault's Sleeping Beauty, Part 2. Last we left off, the princess had touched the spindle and fallen asleep. The fairy, the young fairy, had put to sleep most of the rest of the palace, except for the king and queen. And a hundred years had passed, and the son of a king had heard that there might be a beautiful princess in a castle hidden behind a wood, and he had resolved without delay to see what would come of it. Scarcely had he approached the wood when all these great trees, all those brambles and thorns, made way for him to pass of their own accord. He walked toward the castle, which he saw at the end of a long avenue he had entered, and he was somewhat surprised to find that none of his people had been able to follow him, the trees having closed up again as soon as he had passed. Nevertheless, he continued to advance. A young prince, inspired by love, is always courageous. He came to a large forecourt, where everything he saw might well have frozen his blood with terror. A frightful silence reigned around, death seemed everywhere present. On every side, nothing to be seen but the bodies of men and animals stretched out apparently lifeless. He soon discovered, however, by the shining noses and red faces of the porters, that they were only asleep, and their goblets, in which still remained a few drops of wine, sufficiently proved that they had dozed off whilst drinking. He next passed through a large courtyard paved with marble, ascended the staircase, and entered the guard room, where the guards stood, drawn up in line, their carbines shouldered, and snoring their loudest. He traversed several rooms with ladies and gentlemen, all asleep, some standing, others seated. At last he came to one covered with gold, and there, on a bed, the curtains of which were open on either side, he saw the most lovely sight he had ever looked upon, a princess, who appeared to be about fifteen or sixteen, and whose dazzling beauty shone with a radiance which scarcely seemed to belong to this world. He approached, trembling and admiring, and knelt down beside her. At that moment, the enchantment being ended, the princess awoke, and gazing at him for the first time with unexpected tenderness, Is it you, prince? she said. I have waited long for you to come. The prince, delighted at these words, and still more by the tone in which they were uttered, knew not how to express his joy and gratitude. He assured her that he loved her better than himself. His words were rather confused, but she was all the more pleased with them. There was little eloquence, but a great deal of love. He was much more embarrassed than she was, which is not to be wondered at. She had had time to think over what she should say to him, for there is reason to believe, although history does not mention it, that during her long, long sleep the good fairy had let her enjoy very pleasant dreams. In short, they talked for four hours without having said half of what they had to say to each other. In the meanwhile, all the palace had been roused at the same time as the princess. Everybody remembered his or her duty, and, as they were not all in love, they were dying with hunger. The lady-in-waiting, as hungry as any of them, became impatient, and announced loudly to the princess that the meat was on the table. The prince assisted the princess to rise. She was fully dressed, and most magnificently. But he was careful not to tell her that she was dressed like his grandmother, and wore a stand-up collar, for in spite of this she was not a whit less beautiful. They passed into a hall of mirrors where they supped, waited upon by the officers of the princess. The violins and hot-boys played old but charming pieces of music, notwithstanding that it was a hundred years since they had been performed by anybody, and after supper, without loss of time, the grand almoner married the royal lovers in the chapel of the castle. Early next morning the prince returned to the city, where he knew his father would be in anxiety about him. The prince told him that he had lost his way in the forest whilst hunting, and that he had slept in the hut of a woodcutter who had given him black bread and cheese to eat. The king his father, who was a simple-minded man, believed him, but his mother was not so easily satisfied. She noticed that he went hunting nearly every day, and had always some story ready as an excuse when he had slept two or three nights away from home, and so she felt quite sure that he had a lady love. 
More than two years went by, and the princess had two children. The first, which was a girl, was named Aurora, and the second, a son, was called Day, because he was still more beautiful than his sister. The queen, hoping to find out the truth from her son, often said to him that he ought to form some attachment, but he never dared to trust her with his secret. Although he loved her, he feared her, for she was of the race of ogres, and the king had only married her on account of her great riches. It was even whispered about the court that she had the inclinations of an ogress, and that, when she saw little children passing, it was with the greatest difficulty that she restrained herself from pouncing upon them. The prince, therefore, would never say one word to her about his affairs. On the death of the king, however, which took place two years later, the prince, being now his own master, made a public declaration of his marriage and went in great state to bring the queen, his wife, to the palace. She made a magnificent entry into the capital with her two children, one on either side of her. Some time afterwards, the king went to war with his neighbor, the emperor Cantabulet. He left the queen, his mother, regent of the kingdom, earnestly recommending to her care his wife and children. He was likely to be all summer in the field, and he had no sooner left than the queen mother sent her daughter-in-law and the children to a country house in the wood, so that she might more easily gratify her horrible longing. She followed them thither a few days after, and one evening said to her head cook, I will eat little Aurora for dinner tomorrow. Ah, madam, exclaimed the cook. I will, said the queen, and she said it in the voice of an ogress longing to eat fresh meat. And I will have her served with my favorite sauce. The poor man, seeing plainly that an ogress was not to be trifled with, took his great knife and went up to little Aurora's room. She was then about four years old and came jumping and laughing to throw her arms about his neck and ask him for sweetmeats. He burst into tears, and the knife fell from his hands. Then he went down again and into the farmyard, and there he killed a little lamb, which he served up with so delicious a sauce that his mistress assured him that she had never eaten anything so excellent. In the meanwhile he had carried off little Aurora and given her to his wife, that she might hide her in the lodging which she occupied at the further end of the farmyard. A week later, the wicked queen said to her head cook, I will eat little day for supper. He made no reply, having decided in his own mind to deceive her as before. He went in search of little day and found him with a tiny foil in his hand, fencing with a great monkey, though he was only three years old. He carried the child to his wife, who hid him where she had hidden his sister, then cooked a very tender little kid in the place of little day, which the ogress thought wonderfully good. All had gone well enough so far, but one evening this wicked queen said to the head cook, I should like to eat the queen with the same sauce that I had with the children. Then the poor cook was indeed in despair, for he did not know how he should be able to deceive her. The young queen was over twenty years of age, without counting the hundred years she had slept, and no longer such tender food although her skin was still white and beautiful, and where among all his animals should he find one old enough to take her place? He resolved, at last, that to save his own life he would kill the queen, and he went up to her room, determined to carry out his purpose without delay. He worked himself up into a passion and entered the young queen's room dagger in hand. He did not wish, however, to take her by surprise. So he repeated to her very respectfully the order that he had received from the queen mother. Do your duty, she said, stretching out her neck to him. Obey the orders that have been given you. I shall again see my children, my poor children, whom I loved so dearly. For she had thought them dead, ever since they had been carried away from her without a word of explanation. No, no, madam, replied the poor cook, touched to the quick. You shall not die, you shall see your children again, but it will be in my own house where I have hidden them. I will again deceive the queen mother by serving up to her a young hind in your stead. He led her forthwith to his own apartments, then, leaving her to embrace her children and weep with them, he went and prepared a hind, which the queen ate at her supper with as much appetite as if it had been the young queen.' 
She exulted in her cruelty, and intended to tell the king on his return that some ferocious wolves had devoured the queen, his wife, and her two children. One evening, while she was prowling as usual round the courts and poultry yards of the castle to inhale the smell of fresh meat, she overheard little day, crying in one of the lower rooms because the queen, his mother, was about to whip him for being naughty, and she also heard little Aurora begging forgiveness for her brother. The ogress recognized the voices of the queen and her children, and furious at having been deceived, she gave orders in a voice that made everybody tremble that the next morning early there should be brought into the middle of the court a large copper, which she had filled with toads, vipers, adders, and serpents, in order to throw into it the queen and her children, the head cook, his wife, and his maid servant. She further commanded that they should be brought thither with their hands tied behind them. There they stood, and the executioners were preparing to fling them into the copper when the king, who was not expected back so soon, entered the courtyard on horseback. He had ridden post-haste, and in great astonishment asked what was the meaning of this horrible spectacle. No one dared to tell him when the ogress, enraged at what she saw, flung herself head foremost into the copper where she was instantly devoured by the horrid reptiles with which she had herself caused it to be filled. The king could not help being sorry for it. She was his mother. But he quickly consoled himself with his beautiful wife and children. And at the end of this telling, there is a bit of a moral, a TLDR from Perot. Some time for a husband to wait who is young, handsome, wealthy, and tender may not be a hardship too great for a maid whom love happy would render. But to be for a century bound to live single, I fancy the number of beauties but small would be found so long who could patiently slumber. To lovers who hate time to waste and minutes as centuries measure, I would hint those who marry in haste may live to repent it at leisure. Yet so ardently onward they press, and on prudence so gallantly trample, that I haven't the heart, I confess, to urge on them beauty's example. And that is The Sleeping Beauty in the Wood, told by Master Charles Perrault. It's got action, adventure, love, a bit of consent in there as well. There's no kissing the sleeping princess here, but still, eating children, not great. So we're all very glad for the assistance of the head cook. This is Dan Schultz for the Folktale Project. Don't forget that you can subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, Overcast, anywhere you like to get your podcasts. You can follow us on Twitter at Folktale Project. You can find us on Auto Radio, TuneIn Radio, iHeartRadio, Spotify, anywhere you like to listen. And you can always head over to folktaleproject.com, where you'll find a new story waiting for you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Next week, we'll be back with three new stories. As always, thank you so much for listening.